release event for Without Limits, a shared vision for the future of career technical education. I'm Kimberly Green, Executive Director of Advanced CTE, and I'm delighted that you've chosen to spend a little bit of your day with us. Advanced CTE is a nonpartisan and nonprofit membership organization in its 101st year of serving state directors and other state leaders who have the responsibility for secondary, post-secondary, and adult career technical education in all 50 states, the District of Columbia, and the U.S. territories. Our organization is committed to leading the field of career technical education, inspiring, providing, and supporting bold leadership that is forward-looking, fiercely committed to equity and quality, and collaborative in the creation and execution of measurable results and impact. This shared vision was developed with input from nearly 200 national, state, and local leaders representing K-12 and post-secondary education, workforce development, industry, as well as philanthropy. And they all came together at our CTE Forward Summit that was held in the fall of 2020. When we first start um, our work on planning for this summit in the fall of 2019, we never could have imagined the world as it, it was when we gathered in the fall of 2020. The urgency of our work and the need to move beyond the status quo to tackle the greatest and most persistent barriers to equitable learner success is more critical now than ever before. This vision's emphasis on shared leadership and action is rooted only, not only in its ideation, but in its broad support. To that end, I'm thrilled to share that 38 national partner organizations have signed on to support this vision and its principles, committing to the aspiration of the vision and committing to do the work together needed to make sure that this vision becomes our new reality. Our partners' priorities and missions are diverse, but we all share a commitment to equity, success, and a cohesive, flexible, and responsive career preparation ecosystem that offers limitless opportunities. So without further ado, I present Without Limits, a shared vision for the future of career technical education. This shared vision, the third we've released, is not meant to be just another paper that will sit on a virtual shelf or create a buzz for a day, a week, or even a month. This is a living blueprint for action. To be sure, a lot of progress has been made since we released our first vision about a decade ago, but there's more work to be done. This vision codifies our willingness to challenge ourselves and recommits us to doing the work needed to help more learners realize their full potential. It commits us to the difficult work, the systems work, and the important work. Because we know that we can do more to make sure that every program is high quality and nimbly responding to the ever-changing needs of our economy. We can do more to center our systems on learners, making sure every learner feels welcomed, heard, and supported in the career pathway of their choice. We can do more to disrupt intergenerational poverty and systems of inequity and structural racism. And we can do more to make sure that we're closing skills gaps and building talent pipelines that are adaptive and responsive and value both employers and workers. This vision reminds us of our responsibility as leaders to have courageous conversations, challenge tradition and status quo, and to take the risk of trying to do new things. It's a shared vision with intention. It takes us working together across systems, across states, across sectors to realize the aspiration and the hope of this vision. It requires us to be bold, to have courage, 
to take risk, to challenge assumptions, and to take action. And today's panel of leaders are all individuals who approach their roles in that way. We've assembled an incredibly distinguished panel to reflect on the vision, uh, what the vision means to them from their unique perspectives. As a local superintendent and a former CTE student, a representative of a governor's workforce office, a labor economist, and a philanthropic leader. So it's my great pleasure to turn this over to Sarah Allen, uh, who will serve as the moderator of today's panel. Sarah? Hello, it's great to be here with all of you today. I am Sarah Allen, the Director of Early Learning and Education Pathways at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. I'm grateful for the opportunity today to facilitate this important conversation about a compelling and urgent vision to create a more equitable, connected and effective career preparation system that enables all of our talented young people to reach their full potential. The vision of this Without Limits report is aligned with our pathways work at the foundation, which focuses on ensuring that more students, particularly students of color and those experiencing poverty, obtain credentials of value and have the professional skills, agency, and social capital needed to succeed in education and thrive in the workforce. This blueprint for action couldn't come at a more important moment. The pandemic has really had devastating effects on many students and their families. We know that many high school students were not particularly well engaged in school prior to COVID. And this morning, I just heard our new Secretary of Education talking about how many high school students have disengaged since the pandemic started and are essentially somewhat lost. We also see that incoming community college enrollment plummeted over 20% this fall for freshmen with big drops among black and Latino students. And the debate about reopening schools and moving back into in-person learning is often focused more on younger children. So we're really at risk of losing a generation of young people who are not currently being well supported to complete high school, transition successfully into a post-secondary program of study and ultimately attain the credentials and experiences needed to thrive in the workforce. However, it's not too late. And this vision today helps paint a, a useful roadmap for how we can come out of this crisis much stronger to build systems that support young people to find the path that works for them to move flexibly to and between education and career. And we know from our research with students that young people and particularly students of color universally aspire to build thriving adult lives that include financial stability and the ability to make a meaningful contribution to their families and communities. Unfortunately today though, too many hit roadblocks along the way to that because our K-12 and post-secondary and employment systems were not designed to support all aspects of that journey. To stay on course, especially in these challenging times, students need access to resources and supports and relationships and learning experiences needed to successfully navigate transitions and ultimately thrive in the workforce. As this report points out, we actually already know what that could look like. And there are great examples already of powerful career pre preparation systems and programs that work. I think of examples like Youth Force NOLA, an entity that is connecting young people to technical training supported by employer partners that is providing young people in New Orleans with the tools and resources and experiences they need to thrive and prosper starting in high school. Throughout the pandemic, they continued to connect young people remotely and match them based on their interest to one of the high need skill clusters in New Orleans in health sciences, IT, digital media, and business services. Examples like these remind me that we have a lot to be hopeful about as we look to the future. As we approach the one year anniversary of the COVID-19 pandemic, it's great to have this moment to really contemplate what we want that future to hold. We've all been learning at warp speed this past year about how to reach students where they are, create connections in new ways, and tackle incredible challenges. And now we have the opportunity to put those learnings to work in building better systems, ones that deliver value for students, for educators, and for employers in inclusive and equitable ways. So I'm really excited to spend time today with our wonderful panel to talk about where we go from here. So first of all, we have Dr. Adrian Battle, the Director of Metro Nashville Public Schools. We have Dr. Nicole Smith, the Chief Economist at Georgetown Center for Education and the Workforce, and Emily Fabiano, Director of Strategy and Operations in the Ohio Governor's Office of Workforce uh, Transformation. Why don't we start actually with Emily? Um, and for each of you, I'd love for you just to quickly introduce yourself and talk about where your organization sits 
in the career preparation ecosystem and what you're focused on. So Emily, let's start with you. Great, well, thank you, Sarah. And I'm so excited to be here with a panel of experts today talking about this shared vision for CTE. So again, I'm Emily Fabiano. I'm Director of Strategy and Operations in the Ohio Governor's Office of Workforce Transformation. And we are a small but mighty team and we work across state government, including 17 state agencies to ensure that our education and training programs in Ohio are preparing students for quality wage in demand jobs. So uh, we focus really heavily, to be honest, on career technical education, career focused education in general, and upskilling and reskilling throughout an individual's career journey. So one of the aspects of the vision that really resonated with me personally is the emphasis on collaboration and alignment across K-12, post-secondary workforce development and industry, because that is a strength that we have in Ohio and is kind of how we've built our structure to create that environment that's conducive for collaboration. So I think our charge moving forward is using that strength to achieve our longer term goals related to equity and becoming more nimble, which are big focus areas for us in Ohio. But I also wanted to say that I think that this conversation is very timely because now more than ever, we all need to be coming together to make sure that our education and training programs are preparing people for jobs that are in high demand and for the future of work, which I know is a central part of this vision. And we all know that stigmas have had an impact on CTE enrollment and participation in the past. However, I think we have a, a, an encouraging window of opportunity right now because students and job seekers are increasingly looking for practical, affordable and efficient options, especially during an economic downturn. So many of you have probably uh, seen Strata's public viewpoint survey, but one of the things that I found interesting, they started surveying people in March of 2020, about a year ago now, to learn about their perception about education, jobs and modes of learning. And what they found is that attitudes and preferences toward education have shifted dramatically as a result of the pandemic. And at this point, the majority of Americans, or 62%, have expressed a consistent preference for non-degree skills training options, citing the following reasons, better value, better fit for their personal needs, and more benefit for their job and career advancement. So like I said before, I think this presents a unique opportunity because people are really listening. And I think society is leaning away from the college for all mentality that has fueled stigmas about CTE in the past, even though we know that CTE is a pathway to employment and post-secondary education. So it's our responsibility to help learners understand what CTE is and what it can do for them. And I'm excited to be here today with this group for a discussion on how we can come together to do just that. Thanks so much, Emily. Um, let's go to, to Dr. Nicole Smith. Could, what, could you give us a little bit of a sense of the higher education perspective on you know, why this vision matters uh, and what, what would really be the benefit of having a better system in terms of uh, the future of our country? Thank you, Sarah. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. And I guess I uh, thank you everyone for inviting me to be on this, this really uh, interesting panel on CTE. Um, so I am Nicole Smith and I am the uh, chief economist at the Georgetown University Center on Education and the Workforce. And my work at the center reflects um, usually research and trying to better connect education with workforce development, better to try to better connect post-secondary education with what happens in the long run in terms of gainful employment. So that's what I usually do. Um, so why is this important? And I think it's, it's, it's really important to start off by talking about historical context so we can get a, an, an understanding of, of what's you know, in the rear view mirror. So since the 1980s, um, the demand for college educated workers has outpaced supply. So we know that, and the future is gonna promise more of the same. And I really like to talk about what college education means because sometimes the, it's a misnomer where people tend to think we all mean a bachelor's degree or an associate's degree. And I think you know, it's, it's important for us to always talk about it. A college education includes all training and credentials offered by post-secondary institutions beyond high school. And they often include degrees, yes, but they're also vocational certificates, post-secondary vocational certificates, some college credits offering no credential. 
They may be tied to test-based licenses, certifications, apprenticeships, uh, and a certificate. So that, that's part of the broad spectrum of opportunities um, that we recognize and talk about their contributions. Um, today, we know that about 65% of all jobs are gonna require some form of post-secondary education beyond high school. So it's just, it's, you know, and in the future promises more of the same again. Um, one of the things that I do at the centers is try to forecast and um, our numbers showed it by 2030, um, which is, you know, nine years from now, uh, close to 70, 70, 70% of all jobs uh, nationally will require post-secondary education and training beyond high school. So why do I care about um, this, this shared vision or why should we all care about the shared vision? Um, some things that we should all recognize is that despite what I just talked about, you know, what's happening with jobs and the education required for jobs, many people are still being left behind. Um, and this recession especially has highlighted the stark differences that still exist at all levels between the haves and the have nots, between those who have access and those who don't and access to education, access to the means of education, and we now found out access to jobs that you know pr protect you from exposure, um, you know protect your health, that allow you to social distance. I mean, we can social distance here, and this is, is really instructive of what some other people are, are experiencing. Uh, we now realize that these disparities of which I speak, you know, between the haves and the have-nots, can be a matter of life or, or death because of this pandemic. Um, uh, a significant role for education and training is still to afford its recipients the dignity of work and the ability to earn a living wage. So we still recognize what that's the role, or one of the primary roles of education. So I wanna get to the shared vision and I'm really happy with the extent to which the shared vision embraces and understands its role in helping to shape opportunity for all Americans. So I think that's, that's really important. I mean, the learner remains at the center of each goal. So you have all of these goals and it's, it starts off with the learner, it focuses on the learner, it focuses on the learner's descriptors, the learner's needs, the learner's journey, the, learn, the learner's challenges. It's, it's very, very directed to, to, to the individual needs. And I, I think that the shared vision provides a holistic approach to this concept of lifelong learning for all. So I think it's very important that, that we actually observe that. And I want to emphasize lifelong learning for all and not some. Um, I like it in many ways, the shared ver uh, vision has redefined equity. So we could talk about that a little bit um, because we have, we have equity defined as what it says and what it doesn't say. And, and, and this shared vision talks about all dimensions of equity, including educational, racial, socioeconomic, gender, and geographic, which really defines our new America, our America that is much more inclusive, that has, you know, much um, um, greater amounts of diversity. And I just wanted to, to finally close by openly saying that, you know, by openly talking about this, this, this new definition of equity, because I think all too often we tend to ignore this elephant in the room by looking, you know, to the future and not acknowledging a past that might have included systematic discrimination through tracking because uh, we know that, you know, CTE has this, this, this past that talks about that. So we can openly acknowledge that and openly find ways of um, circumventing that past and doing right by all Americans. And I, I'm really happy that we've chosen to um, um, define this shared vision. I think it's, it's an opportune time, um, given this new administration, given the way in which we are we're finding our feet with um, um, recognizing our past and, and working uh, towards the shared vision. So I'm, I'm, I'm really happy and, and thank you for the opportunity to, to give these remarks. Excellent, so much for us to, to dive into. Um, let's go to, to Dr. Battle. I would love to hear the K-12 perspective. You know, lifelong learning, obviously critical, but so essential that we get the first part of, of, uh, of this education to employment pathways uh, pipeline right on the front end to avoid people having to recover later. So we'd love to hear your thoughts on um, where you see opportunity at, at this time. 
Absolutely, and thank you, um, Sarah, for the question and um, to be a part of the panel today. Hello, Emily and Nicole. I'm looking forward to our discussions. Um, I'm Adrienne Battle. I have the pleasure of serving as the Director of Schools for Metro Nashville Public Schools here in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, and again, I appreciate the opportunity to join you all for this event. I've had a lot of different roles in the current district that I'm serving in, um, including being a student um, in a CTE class that helped lead me down the path to becoming a teacher um, as a principal of a large um, zone high school here in my district that has um, many high pack CTE programs. And now as a leader of a district with a strong belief in the power of career and technical education. Our CTE vehicle here in Nashville is the Academies of Nashville, uh, which have become an international model over the last 15 years while making a big difference in our schools and in our community here in Nashville. Each of our 12 zone high schools has two to four career academies supported by local business partners. The academies expose students to career possibilities early in high school, um, giving them time to explore options and discover their passions. And as mentioned um, in the opening conversation, we really thought about our pathways for success, starting with our earliest learners in pre-K and kindergarten, all the way through their high school experience. You know, given the fact that I've worn many different hats um, in my current school district, I've seen the light bulbs um, go off for our students as they um, have engaged in their CTE classrooms, bringing their unique set of skills and aspirations um, to the table, starting out um, early on with aspirations. And by the time they get to their senior capstone, they have a whole new um, kind of eye-opening um, journey um, before them. And they feel prepared um, for those, those journeys as they move on um, into their careers, into post-secondary um, um, opportunities, and just into life in general. The academies also have shown us some new ways to engage students in preparation for college and careers. We've seen in the past year just how important that engagement is. And although the academies couldn't do much in person until all our high school students were finally able to come back to their buildings this month, they translated their activities to the virtual environment and kept everyone right on track. So ever since the beginning of our academies, we've been met with great success um, and academic success and engagement for our students. Um, all the way through their level of engagement um, in, in all of their courses um, that they um, engage in from, again, their earliest time in our district until the time they graduate. We all know that the economy has taken huge hits, and it's so important that students have skills that they can apply in the job market. That's why the Nashville business community is all in in the academies of Nashville. And that's why this shared national vision for CTE is so important but we have to keep pushing for equity for all students as well. That's why we've tried to do that. That's what we've tried to do in the academies of Nashville here. We want every student to have an opportunity to learn career skills and gain experiences that can launch them into a very promising future. We owe our students that opportunity and that's what we're committed to here in Metro Nashville Public Schools. We're gonna pause for a minute and then get back into our binary discussion. Well, me as an educator, uh, my role in this new vision is is extremely important because if I buy in into the system that I'm that I'm teaching, the students actually get a hold of that new energy that I have. If we teach towards the interest of our learner, it uh, actually makes them be more active and proactive in their learning. The entire goal for for having the learners involved in this is because. The instructor is no longer an instructor at that point, but he becomes a facilitator. And the students start running the class and not in a bad way, but they start becoming more involved and they become responsible for their education, uh, which makes a more powerful learner. It's changing, the world changes every day. Every, every moment the world changes, the students learn different. It's extremely important that we encompass these students and surround these school students and support their vision and how they're going to be successful once they leave the high school. Hello from the great state of Maryland. I am Tierra Booker DeWire, the Assistant State Superintendent for the Division of Career and College Readiness and Office of Leadership Development and School Improvement at the Maryland State Department of Education. CTE Without Limits inspires leaders to purposefully reflect on equity and excellence in CTE. 
It challenges us to take action and set a direction that ensures that all students have the opportunity to engage in high quality CTE experiences. A vision is required that addresses systemic inequities, that intentionally reaches learners with the most barriers and access to success. Together, we can achieve this vision. Greetings, my name is Sarah Heath, president of Advanced CTE, and I'm excited to talk to you a little today about, without limits, a shared vision for career and technical education. A learner-centered vision is critical to empowering our learners across the country to connect with business and industry through work-based learning programs, have a CTE program where they can concentrate, leading to an industry-recognized credential, all while having seamless navigation so they can go from point A to point B along their career pathway and engage with business and industry and post-secondary in a meaningful way. This vision helps us as CTE leaders provide CTE without limits. I'm looking forward to connecting this vision with our CTE strategic plan, as well as our comprehensive local needs assessment process for Perkins 5. For more information, please visit advancedcte at careertech.org. Adrian, just coming back to you for a moment, um, one of the challenges in, in CTE historically has been, it's been seen as sort of a separate thing, that there's the core academic work of K-12 and then there's the CTE program on the side. Do you think we should be thinking now about the whole education system as part of the career pathways development system, or should we continue to think that career pathways development is just part of, part of K-12? How do, you, how do you think about that? I think we are in a place where we have to really be thinking about um, it in an integrated way. Um, our, our CTE programs, what we're focused on in our academies of Nashville is to integrate um, those pathways into everything into our core instruction. You know, we're working very hard with um, all of our teachers in planning side by side um, because we all need to be aware of what it's going to require of our students um, once they um, graduate from high school and move on to their uh, post-secondary opportunities. Opportunities. And to do this well and to do it in an equitable way, uh, we all play a role and have to recognize the role we play in educating all of our students. Um, I mentioned um, early on that um, I am a product of the, of the school district where I'm serving as a director of schools. And so I've been able to follow our path in this direction. Um, as a student, um, I remember it being very isolated from, from everything that I experienced um, as a student. And I literally had one or two teachers who knew what I aspired to do um, and experience once I graduated from high school. And now through our academies of Nashville, we have school teams and the community uh, well aware um, of what our students um, are preparing for, um, for the job market, um, for the career aspirations and opportunities after they graduate. So it is critically important that we continue to think through um, career and technical education, technical education through an equity lens, but also through a an, a very integrated approach to make sure we're providing the necessary opportunities and skill sets to all of our students. Emily, I uh, would love to hear your perspective sitting in the governor's office. How do you think about the definition of a career pathway system and how to, how to create the linkages across K-12 and workforce and higher ed? Thank you, Sarah. I love that question. And I think your um, your, the way you described it is really spot on because I think when we create an other bucket for CTE, it kind of fuels some of the challenges we've had with stigma and access. And um, in Ohio, I'm really proud of our leadership because the DeWine Houston administration has been very focused on bringing CTE to the student and weaving or integrating it, as Dr. Battle said, into the education experience, regardless of whether they are enrolled. And so there, there are a couple of ways that we are doing this. As one tangible example, we have an investment that we're proposing in this upcoming budget that will invest, help invest in high school credentials for students bringing that opportunity to all students. So we have investment that will reimburse schools for the cost of credential exams when students complete credentials. Breaking down the barrier, uh, the cost barrier to earning those credentials is really important to access as well. And then we also are creating a new program that creates a list of priority in demand credentials based on input from the business community 
about which jobs are in the highest demand, and we're providing incentive payments to schools for offering in-demand credentials, and we're also offering startup grants to help schools pay for costs associated with building these new credentialing programs in in-demand areas like equipment, for example. So recognizing that the needs are changing quickly, we are working closely with our industry partners to make sure that that integration exists and that students have access regardless of where they are, whether they're in a traditional school or CTE school specifically, to be able to uh, earn those credentials. And uh, I really like the way you worded your question. I think really from our perspective, it's about orienting around the role that education systems play within a broader career preparation system. You mentioned from where I sit in the governor's office, we know that these skills needs are constantly evolving, which creates, as we've talked about, the imperative for all people to become lifelong learners. And we view it as a workforce continuum with pre-K, K-12, post-secondary, adult training, and so on. And so CTE plays an absolutely essential role in that continuum, whether it's for K-12 students or adults. But from our view, we are really focused on making those connections and integrations between the suppliers of workforce, uh, which are the education and training systems, and the demand on the employer and economic development side. So this is a really complex vision with lots of moving parts. Uh, we'd love to hear each of you comment around, you know, where do we, where do we get started? Wh which, which areas of this should we be pressing on in the short run while thinking about some of the longer term actions? Let's start with, uh, let's start with Dr. Smith. So um, I'm going to put on my, my economist hat here and go straight to the fact that um, I think uh, we should we should definitely be focused on gainful employment. So at the end and almost backward looking, we want to make sure that when we counsel our students and we you know talk to them and and sort of help them navigate their career pathways, that they also have a recognition for um, where they could end up, which um, uh, types of credentials get them, which types of occupations, which types of jobs, and how much those jobs pay. And, 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 you know, I, I'm always careful about talking about that because there's lots of people that almost believe it's, it's you know, a little bit crass to keep mentioning money as if that's the ultimate goal. Because when you look at the way the shared vision is defined, it's defined as focusing on each person and, and recognizing that all types of learning is valued and recognizing that the different learning styles are valued. But I think it's also important to recognize um, uh, employment um, um, option here. And, and for, for many, it's definitely um, a career that can sustain you and sustain your family. And, and you know, once we talk about that, then um, I, I think it's really important. It's, it's really interesting that um, uh, the CTE can, can uh, to get you there. Um, one thing that we had discussed in the past about CTE, and, and I guess it's, uh, it's, problem, you know, it's history with, with tracking has to do with, um, for many people, not recognizing how valuable CTE could be and not recognizing that this is a viable career pathway that can take you to sustainable and living wages. So we sort of have to, you know, be very mindful of addressing um, that issue and is making sure that, that people are aware that these are, you know, good jobs and these are good jobs that pay well and these are, you know, career jobs and, and great opportunities for, for many people. That's great. Dr. Bell, love your thoughts on, you know, where to focus in the short run versus the long run in terms of getting all the pieces of this vision pulled together. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, my, my mind first goes to the um, focus we need to have on career pathways um, for, for our um, students and for our school leadership teams to be thinking through um, and about. We cannot leave um, our focus around equity, um, ensuring that these high quality career pathway opportunities exist for all students, uh, regardless of the school or type of school that um, a student attends. And, you know, I'm going to piggyback on something that Nicole said that, you know, in the K-12 space, we tend to have lots of conversations around the funding or the investments um, that will be required um, for the proper training, 
training um, for our staff, for the credentialing um, the students can obtain through the career pathways um, experiences to ensure that our students, um, as they're graduating, as they're continuing to train and go off into their careers and to their career fields, that they can um, really obtain a, a living wage um, and, and have access to high demand, high wage um, opportunities uh, once they graduate um, from, from high school. And so, you know, we have to continue to invest um, to make sure these quality experiences um, are there that are engaging, that connect to the aspirations and the desires and the talents um, of our wonderful K-12 students. That's great. Emily, you know, would love to hear your thoughts. I mean, as we talk about lifelong learning and the idea of, of integration and, and supporting students along that journey, one of the key elements of the support really focuses on the idea that you're always building on your prior learning. You're always able to take what you've learned and then go to the next step and add on. You know, what are some of the things that you're thinking about from the state level that can be done to really enable that sort of portability, transferability and stackability of, of experiences as well as education to help people continually along their, along their journey to, uh, to prosperity? Absolutely, this is a really important aspect of the work and it's one of the, the more difficult challenges that we face and that we work on every day. But uh, the, the idea of a career pathway or a workforce continuum is really important. And in, I like to think about this from the perspective of the people we serve, the students, the job seekers, and the types of questions that they may ask. If you were you know, a mentor to a 13 year old, the types of questions she might ask you are, you know, what kind of courses should I take in high school? What, what should be my path after high school? Should I go into college? Should I go into some shorter term training opportunity? What kind of careers might I be interested in? What kind of jobs are available? These are all really important. I think that it's important that state leaders and people who work in this space are doing everything we can to integrate our systems on the back end so that we can help learners answer those questions more holistically. So, you know, in, in Ohio, we have multiple state agencies. You know, let's say agency A is focused on the K-12 system and career technical education. Agency B is focused on post-secondary education and, you know, pathways and credit articulation. And agency C is focused on incentives for economic development and for business and understanding and meeting the needs of of workforce development. So if we can, as leaders, bring those organizations together and the programs and the data and the priorities to help do the back end work so that we can create those seamless pathways between you know, programs in K-12 that help students earn college credit while they're in high school, you know, credentials that stack well with some sort of post-secondary opportunity, maybe it's community college, maybe it's a four-year uh, institution and then connections to the workforce and beyond. That's really where we're focused is taking it to the next level so that we do the back end work to make those pathways more seamless for the people that we serve. I want to bring the conversation back to equity, which is was you know highlighted so clearly in this report and on the front end of some of your remarks. You know. We all have seen the fact that even when we have great advising and career pathway structures and programs, if they're not equally accessible to all learners, we don't get equity in the outcomes. So would really uh, appreciate hearing maybe at a, a level of detail, um, what, what, you're think, what you think can be done at the level of the school district or higher education institution to really make sure that these new opportunities are open and available to all students. Um, Dr. Battle, let's start with you with the K-12 perspective. Yes, happy to um, jump in here. And, you know, I, I want to acknowledge that it's been a very unique year for, for all of us. Um, in the K-12 space, we um, have had to pivot and adapt in ways that we've never dreamed of before. Um, but I truly believe that we're going to come um, out of this pandemic stronger than we 
um, have definitely come in. Um, some of the work that we've been doing here um, in Nashville, we've just recently launched um, what we're calling our core tenants, our focus outcomes for our students, um, really detailing what we expect um, as outcomes for every student, um, given their grade level, given where they are in preparation for um, a strong pathway towards success. And so we've been very explicit um, around having those high expectations, but also high supports um, for our students um, as they journey um, through their pathway. Um, a few things that we've done here in Nashville, we just recently launched um, a navigators program. I mean, just talking about equity, our navigators program, we have assigned every MMPS student, we have over 80,000 students that we serve, um, a navigator, um, an adult um, who reaches out to them frequently, uh, whether they be in the in-person learning environment or virtually, um, to really connect with where they are and getting them connected to the right resources, answering questions immediately around their next steps, which courses they should be rolling in, uh, what um, enrichment opportunities exist, it's experiential learning. Uh, we're just making sure we're staying very connected uh, with our students, particularly during this time. And this is an effort that we're going to continue on uh, post pandemic. Um, we have a tagline line here that it's it, to get at this equity need. Our tagline is every student is known. We want to make sure that every student is known, cared for, and seen in everything that we do. Um, and so that's where all of our efforts currently um, are um, and pouring into our students so that they're on these pathways, career pathways towards success. We reached, recently partnered with one of our local um, community colleges um, here under um, an umbrella of Better Together. And uh, again, just going back to something Emily just shared, we're focused on creating that long runway of success for our students so that we're not having to, or our students are not experiencing um, learning to navigate a whole new system um, after they graduate from high school, but how we can make this a seamless um, experience um, and supports and opportunities for every MMPS student, regardless of if they're going to a two-year institution, four-year, or directly into their careers. And so through our partnership with um, our local community college, it's about providing those opportunities to, to all all students, um, shoring up those career pathways so that every student is known and we can um, kind of sunset some of those legacy programs that don't align um, to our regional uh, workforce demand or um, the aspirations of our students. And so we're trying to pull back the layers of just not looking at things from um, a state level, um, just a district level, but all the way down to each individual student's pathway towards success. Dr. Smith, you and I have talked in the past about how the higher education system is, you know, long has a pattern of sort of sorting students into different tiers of opportunity by race and income, not only across institutions, but within institutions. So we'd love to hear some of your thoughts on how, uh, how to overcome that, that historical pattern to make sure that opportunity truly is accessible to, to all students. <laughs> yeah, but thank you, Sarah. And I, I want to first say that we, we spend a lot of time talking about it um, across different types of institutions, within institutions, and, and it's just, you know, in a, in a way, it's how our country is defined. So we're really, you know, up against a huge challenge here to make sure we, we you know, include um, uh, much more diversity in our enrollment <laughs> at higher ed, in our graduation in higher ed. Uh, within different programs as well. It's not just the, you know, total numbers. And so one of the, the things I want to go jump a little bit forward, when we look at um, occupations, occupations are still hugely segregated by gender, by race, ethnicity. And one of the reasons they're, they're so um, segregated is by the time you look backwards into um, the, the education and the training and the skill set that individuals have, they don't have those skill sets to access those jobs. You look backward, why don't you have it? Well, I didn't get that type of training in, in post-secondary institutions. Why? Well, I didn't have the entry-level courses at K-12. Why? Well, because of this particular, you know, circumstances, my socioeconomic circumstances, um, uh, even, even at preschool level. So we understand that a lot of what you observe, even years into the future in occupational segregation, or whatever um, definition of segregation, can in fact be traced to family background, can in fact be traced to socioeconomic status. So how can you make sure, even at the post-secondary level, that we 
you know, our, we set um, uh, goals that achieve the outcomes that we talk about here. And I think it's really important to incentivize higher ed to do that. So higher ed has an incentive now to graduate n- numbers. Everybody tells you I've graduated X amount of AAs, X amount of BAs. We need to incentivize, tell me what is your graduation rate by programs, by programs, by particular characteristics. We need to know what happens to those people once they leave. Are they in, engaged in, in, in you know, gainful employment? And we all know what happened to the gainful employment rule when we tried in the past to only implement that for, uh, for for-profit institutions. So I still believe that in essence, um, it matters for us to know, you know what happens to our people when they graduate um, from post-secondary institutions. And the only way to know that is to target so this is what we're doing. We're going to definitely target who, who we, we need to have enrolled and into particular programs. We have to measure. So our metrics are important. We need to know the extent to which we've achieved our goals or if we need to, you know, make adjustments. And we need to adjust um, and target again so that each time we can get inroads into this overall objective. So it is a massive undertaking in a way it's um, related to the outcomes that we observe is related to the incentive programs that we have, and we can find ways of incentivizing these outcomes for higher ed. Thank you. You know, all of you have called out that there are a lot of challenges and barriers to some of this, um, and we can't get there overnight. Would love to hear from each of you, you know, what are some of the most critical barriers to focus on? And if you if you had the ability to just wave a magic wand or, or maybe more realistically, you know, whisper in the ear of your governor or the new administration, you know, some of the critical things that they could do to overcome some of these barriers, what would, what would you want to highlight? Um, let's start with, with Emily. That's a great question, Sarah. And I'm going to take kind of a global uh, vision wide perspective to this question. And I think one of the, top barriers that we can experience when we're looking to make transformational systems change like this vision is, is a lack of buy-in. And I think, you know, articulating a a structurable vision is the first step. And we've, we've done that. Vance CTE has done that. And I think that this vision is really strong because it has clearly been developed with input from many stakeholders and does not assume what the challenges are, but actually listens to people who are on the ground doing the work and understanding the challenges best. So I think that 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 makes this work really strong. Uh, But a a big potential barrier with this type of work is just the buy-in. So um, making sure that we're building buy-in with stakeholders throughout the way because this is a vision that each group of stakeholders must be able to participate in and get behind if we are to achieve it together. And then from there, that can be really powerful and impactful because people who do this work every day have the most valuable input, whether they are educators or career coaches, maybe they're caseworkers, businesses. And sometimes when you get that momentum going, you have people who are invested enough to either help lead or implement the work and it, it becomes transformational from there. So I think we can, we can be most successful when we listen to and learn from the input and we empower our partners to own certain aspects of the strategy and of the work and everyone's invested and the workload is shared among many. And I think that this vision is something that all these diverse groups can get behind and work together on, but um, making sure that that buy-in is there is really key to the long-term success. Thanks. Uh, Dr. Battle, over to you. You know, from the K-12 perspective, um, one thing that would really um, help us, and again, I've talked about some of the partnerships we have here with our local um, colleges and universities is, you know, rethinking um, our MOUs and our data sharing um, agreements. 
um, again, we don't have the time to reinvent the wheel um, year after year. And so it will be very insightful for us in the KTO space, I know in higher education, um, to be working from the same game plan, <laughs> if you will, understanding what has led to success for our students, um, how we can come together to remove barriers um, and expand opportunities um, for our students. And so we found it, um, we found it difficult um, sometimes to get to the point of, you know, creating useful dashboards and 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 having proper conversations that might most inform um, our ability to be most effective um, in this in this space. Um, I would also, you know, share that having timely and um, informative data helps. Um, a lot of times in the K-12 space, a lot of our data, particularly as our students matriculate on to post-secondary is lagging. Um, and so, you know, learning from that um, data um, and the successes will help us to adapt um, and to make adjustments where we see them, particularly given the career pathways um, that we're trying to create in the K-12 space. Um, I would agree the cross-collaborative um, conversations and planning matter, uh, recognizing that there's lots of expertise um, across the board um, in these partnerships and being willing to sit around the table and to grow and learn from one another. I know through our Academies of Nashville model, um, we've learned um, a great deal and have, have had many more successes with bringing in our business leaders and um, local uh, companies and organizations to best inform how we should, um, should be preparing um, our students and also with our local colleges and universities around um, sharing best practices for instruction and um, experiences for students towards their success. And the last thing I'll say is common language. Language matters. Um, and I think we need to be very um, aware of how we're um, engaging and connecting um, everyone, all of our stakeholders around career pathways um, and the many opportunities that um, we can create as we prepare our students for um, living and leading successful and productive lives. Dr. Smith, where are you seeing opportunities for, for policymakers to perhaps uh, get behind this vision and make some significant changes? Well, I think, especially since we, you know, we've been spending so much time talking about equity, um, uh, a big challenge to equity has always been access. A big challenge to equity has always been um, uh, ability to pay. So once you recognize that, we, we have to talk about um, grants and extending you know, opportunities to, to, uh, through the Pell Grants and, and, and so that people can have access to, to education. We spent a lot of time talking about different types of learning and value and recognition with the different types of credentials, be it credit, non-credit, whether it's a post-secondary vocational certificate, but not all the people who pursue those um, types of learning in post-secondary actually have access to Pell because we have requirements for number of hours and, and you know, I think it's 600 hours in some cases and how much seating. So, and then we also have, um, as a researcher, there's a lot of evidence that there's no direct connection between those, those hours and actually the um, uh, wage benefits of some of these credentials. So um, at the end of the day, if we talk about value, you have to put your money where your mouth is. If you recognize the value of non-credit, then make adjustments to Pell so that we can access Pell for these types of programs and access provide access to a broader community so they can get the education and training uh, that um, still continues to be a challenge for them. I really like that, you know, aligning value with programming, with with uh, with funding, with policy, that that idea of alignment and coherence really, really comes through in this in this vision. You know, we're, we're wrapping up here. So I just wanted to throw out one additional question to you all and you can just go through and rapid fire and uh, and answer it. Um, you know, each of you is representing a different seat in this ecosystem, the K-12, higher ed, workforce. As you think about your peers across across states and across your regions, what what's one piece of advice you have for for them around where they should be focusing in the next few years to help make this vision a reality? Um, let's start with you, Emily. Thank you. Well, uh, I would just say that whether you are an educator or a workforce professional, a philanthropist, a caseworker no matter what your role is or your interest is in CTE, these students, uh, K-12 students and adults are our future. They're our future workforce. 
They are the future leaders of our communities and it is everyone's shared responsibility to ensure that success. And so I would just say your role in this work is essential and your engagement matters. And my best advice would be to find the person in your network who is convening these conversations within your state or your district or your organization so that you can become engaged in advancing that mission. And if you, if you look and you find that nobody is convening those conversations, that's a good time to consider whether you're able to convene the conversations yourself. So sometimes the best conveners can be state agencies. Sometimes they can be local leaders. In my uh, personal experience, we are most effective when we're able to merge the state and local discussions for a kind of combined approach and strategy. Dr. Smith? So I, I, I'm just gonna pivot a little bit by saying, um, I would be concerned about two things. I'd be concerned about what's happening with this um, Biden-Harris administration and infrastructure and are we adequately prepared to train those people? So I'd, I'd wanna have those types of conversations. And, um, I'd also focus on the fact that we are still um, uh, experiencing the silver tsunami. So we still have a lot of um, uh, baby boomers who are graduating and, and, and to Emily's point, we need to, to train the workforce of the future. So we have um, a challenge of making sure we have replacement uh, skills for those retiring baby boomers. And we also have the challenge that the Obama administration experienced where they created all these shovel ready jobs and people were in shovel ready because they didn't have the education and training. So we need to spend the time um, uh, focusing on making sure that we better connect the individuals um, and the American individuals who are very diverse, who have a lot of different backgrounds so that you know, the equity challenge remains to make sure that they can take up those jobs that are coming. And Dr. Bell. You know, my piece of advice here is, is pretty simple. Um, you know, we have to be courageous. We have to be willing not to have all the answers and to know that you may fall down before you walk or run. And despite all of that, we have to stay the course. We have to stay the course. This is hard work and it takes time. It takes collaboration, um, investment of time, of talent and resources. But we should all just be encouraged to find um, an area that we can start work and roll up our sleeves because it is essential to the success of all of our young people. Well, that's a really great positive note to end on. Thank you all so much. This has been a really robust conversation. Uh, you know, just so much opportunity really to come together around a common framework and vision. And as you say, continue just to stay the course in, in service of is our young people and, and the future economy and uh, in our country. So really wanted to uh, say thank you all for your time today. This has been a great conversation and uh, look forward to continuing to work together in, in service of this compelling vision. Thank you so much for our amazing panelists for joining us today, for the work that you do every day, for your inspiration and your leadership, and for being partners in the implementation and realization of this vision. Thanks to all 38 of our partner organizations who signed on in support of Without Limits. And thanks to each of you who joined us today. This ambitious vision could only be achieved with commitment, hard work, and leadership at all levels, which means all of you joining us. For more information, please visit careertech.org slash without dash limits to read the vision, learn more about our supporters, learn more about how you can get involved, including joining us on a Twitter chat on March 25th at 4 p.m. So we hope that we can count you in among those who are going to be supporting us and signing on to be a supporter and implementer of this vision. Now let's get to work.